Can we have the next question, please? Um, that's the, okay, uh, good evening, Prime Minister. I'm Mohammad Farouk Osman. I'm a year two NUS sociology major. Okay, so basically the government has been arguing that in Singapore there is social mobility. I think this is probably true, but I think what I think a serious analysis of mobility in Singapore should make a distinction between absolute mobility and relative mobility. The point is relative mobility is the true measure of mobility. And so, like for example, we can say that both students from high income family and low income family experience improvement in their life chances. But the point is, what matters is whether both groups improve at the same rate. Sadly, in Singapore, this isn't the case because the, leveling, the, the playing field isn't level. And furthermore, um, I mean, to put it simply, we might be doing well in terms of absolute mobility, but in terms of relative mobility, we are doing absolutely badly. So, and this is, this is exacerbated by the fact that although Singapore is a first world country, it has a third world wage structure. And this is according to the Straits Times, not from anywhere else. And even Professor Do, do you Tommy believe everything Cook. you read in the Straits Times? <laughs> yes, I mean, these are like academic discussions. That's why uh, I believe. Yeah, and but, even Professor Tomiko agreed with this. So my question is... But, but I disagree with Professor Tomiko. <laughs> I hope yes. I will be allowed to right. do so. Okay, I mean, my last question is, like, how do you ensure that the forthcoming, uh, forthcoming fourth-generation leadership truly understands Singapore's social realities? Thank you. Well... It, I, you, I have a lot of sympathy for what you say. Mobility is, whether you call it absolute or relative mobility, is something which is very difficult to achieve in a stable society. Because the people who are successful will tend to have children who are successful. The people who are less successful will tend to have kids who are also... They don't have as good a head start in life. We can try and even it out. I think in Singapore we have done a lot to even it out. But to make everybody have the same head start in life, I have to take away kids from parents and put them all in one crash and mix them up. And I don't think that's a good solution. So what we can do is to we'll make sure that even if you come from a poor home, that you, the opportunities are there and the investments are there. We are starting very young with preschool because we discovered that the better off kids all went to uh, kindergarten and by the time they reach primary one, they can read, they can write, they can sing, they can dance. <laughs> and the other kids who didn't go to kind kindergarten were at a disadvantage. So we've got very generous subsidies for low-income kids going to kindergartens. We've got generous subsidies for low-income families putting their kids into childcare where they can also get good environment and education, some education. And we encourage the parents to take advantage of this so that their kids get a head start in life. We can, and we can do what I described just now in my speech. Make every school in Singapore a good school. You don't have to go to RI or ACS or Hua Chong to get a good education. Any school you go into, you have good, committed teachers, excellent facilities, and the opportunity to move into different classes and do different things if you show talent and promise. And I think we have been able to do that. I was at a community function this weekend, um, and one secondary school put up some art displays, pictures, paintings done by their students, uh, ceramics, flower arrangement. And I spoke to the teacher. This was Naval Bay Secondary School. It's not a famous school. I think most of you may not have heard of it. I don't know if there's any Naval Base alumni here. Not this evening. But I was very warm to see what the teacher was doing because I had cited them previously, National Day Rally. I said, this is a school where they've got good art program, they get talented kids, and the students, on one year, they went to Spain. But that year, they didn't go to the Alhambra. And the teacher came to see me. She says, 
I'm going to Spain this year with my kids. I'm going to take them to the Alhambra this year. It's an ordinary neighborhood school, but we can provide this because we've got EduSave, because we've got opportunity funds, because the government cares about it. I think that's not doing a little bit. That's doing quite a lot. We can do more. But finally, what it depends on is the kids themselves and their parents to want to move up and to take advantage of the opportunities which are there. And we must help them. We cannot go, we cannot close off doors for them. You do not want people to dress differently, then you laugh at the other guy, says, oh, he doesn't know how to dress, he doesn't know how to speak, he doesn't know how to hold his glass properly, so he doesn't belong, he feels awkward. Which is what happens in uh, Britain, for example, between the upper classes and the working classes. But we want everybody to feel comfortable with one another, whether you're in the hawker center, whether you're in the park, whether you're in the cinema. We are all Singaporeans together. And I think we should try and keep it like that as long as we can. And then you can study it in your sociology class. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank PM you. Lee. Farouk's questions certainly sounded like a long comment to me. If I may remind the audience to keep your questions short and concise to give everyone ample opportunity. Next question, please. Good evening, Prime Minister. Uh, my name is David. Um, I'm from the National University of Singapore, uh, and I'm a student in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. What are you studying? Uh, political science. Yes. Um, my question is this. Um, now, this election uh, sort of has a, a pretty strong lineup of uh, opposition members in this coming election. And my question is, in the unfortunate event that uh, the PAP loses, let's say, one or two GRCs, how will this, how will this affect uh, leadership renewal? And um, what are the, contingen the contingency plans of the PAP? Thank you. you no, know, I think we fight to win, and the voters have to decide. And we take the opposition seriously in every constituency, and all our MPs have been working hard and preparing. I don't... The, when you are going into battle, you do not ask what will happen if we lose. You ask, how do I make sure that we win? And I think that's what we are focused on. But whatever the outcome, these are very serious decisions which voters are making when they go to the polls and mark the ballot paper. So they have to think carefully and they have to live with the consequences of their choices. Thank you for, for, thank you for your answer, PMB.